All right, everybody. As promised, we're going to go over a modest proposal. Uh, I will include in this in the link that I send out a uh, a short rendition of this, a filmic rendition, uh, which I think is sort of amusing and also very disturbing at the same time. So when you were all reading this, you probably wondered, why does this guy have a job? Um, he's asked me to read this proposal, which is suggesting that we eat babies. Uh, and I often assign this uh, without telling my students anything about it, because I find it interesting the way that they react. Um, and really, the whole point of this piece centers around the reaction that it tends to elicit from, from people who read it. Um, and I'll just go ahead and break the secret to you. This is what's called a satire, meaning that it is not to be taken seriously. A satire is something which uses humor, irony, or ridicule to uh, convey a specific point, a point which is often political in nature. Um, so this is a satire. It was written in 1729 by a man named Jonathan Swift, and it has to do with a political and social crisis that had been going on between two countries. These two countries are England, also known as Great Britain, or the UK, and Ireland. Um, and basically, Britain had colonized Ireland and had set up a method of extorting the Irish people and shipping huge amounts of their food out of the country for the gain of the British Empire. Uh, and this went on for hundreds of years. Um, and by the time Jonathan Swift came around, who was a British man living in Ireland, uh, the problems in Ireland had gotten so bad as a result of this uh, colonial extortion that the poverty was really tough to look at. But the thing is, is that the British people didn't really have to look at the poverty. You've heard that expression, out of sight, out of mind. And so the pr problems were allowed then to continue because uh, the British people were unwilling or unable to view them as problems. And there was a lot of uh, contributing factors to this problem. Um, religious difference played a role. We know that by this point in time, the, the uh, Great Britain was Anglican, which is a variation of, of Protestantism. And uh, Ireland was Catholic um, and remains mostly Catholic to this day. Um, and so there were religious differences. There were also some genetic differences. The Irish are primarily Celtic, whereas um, Britain does have Celtic in it, but also uh, Anglo-Saxon and other, other various um, influxes of, of different people happened on the Brit on Britain uh, that didn't happen really so much in Ireland. So there were some genetic differences. Uh, and also there are two countries living in the same proximity. Um, that's usually a recipe for conflict. There are two small islands in the North Atlantic. Uh, and one of the islands, Britain, uh, eventually was able to create an empire that spread all around the world. Um, so this was a difficult situation. And by the time Jonathan Swift came along, uh, the people in Ireland were really suffering. There was a lot of poverty, uh, unchecked poverty. There were a lot of problems with crime and things like that. And nobody wanted to do anything about it. Um, oftentimes, the British people would just blame the Irish. This is because the Irish of, in their corrupt ways. Uh, or a lot of times, they just didn't care. So Jonathan Swift didn't really have the option of not caring. He was living in Ireland. So he had to see this on a daily basis. And he was sort of confronted with the challenge of how to get people in the British mainland to understand um, the nature of the problem and the ways in which they were contributing to the problem. So he decided to uh, write a satire wherein he would suggest that the way we could solve the problem would be to eat the babies of the Irish children. Now, you can imagine the way that this reacted, the, the kind of reaction that this caused. Um, for one, he's embracing one of the biggest taboos that human beings have, and that's cannibalism. Um, we don't eat each other. That's just off the table. And yet, in this proposal, he very calmly suggests that that's exactly what sh we should do. And not only eat people, but eat babies. Um, and if you were paying close attention, you could notice that there is humor in this piece, um, but it's very, very sort of 
uh, subtly dispersed. And so a lot of people read it thinking that he's serious and thinking that the intention is really to eat the babies. But of course, that's not what he wanted to do at all. He was using the eating of the babies as a way to shock people awake and get them to understand, hey, you are causing this problem. This is not created by itself. It's not created by the Irish. This is the product of British extortion. And if you want it to stop, then you need to take responsibility. That was the real underlying point. Um, so how <clears throat> was it that he was able to convince people? Well, for one, he crunched the numbers. Um, he, he really made it sound like he had done the logical work to figure this out. It is true, a child just dropped from its dam may be supported by her milk for a solar year with little other nourishment at most not above the value of two shillings. So he's calculated the price that it would take to feed a mother and her, uh, her child. And that is just one of numerous calculations that he makes. Uh, including how many um, children you could yield, how many women would be eligible to breed. Um, and he really did the math before he wrote the piece. And why would you bother to do the math if you didn't actually mean it? Of course, this is what people thought when they read the, the, uh, the proposal. The other thing that he did to uh, kind of jar people awake is he used language to describe human beings, which we really don't like people to use. Language that we uh, most commonly associate with livestock or agriculture. You'll notice back up here, a child just dropped from its dam. That is not language that we typically use to describe the birthing process in human beings. That's what you would expect to hear from someone who's breeding cattle or something. So there's a lot of this use of this language. Later, he refers to women as breeders, um, where he's basically um, dehumanizing them. And of course, when we see it in this way, it, it enrages us. It even enraged the British. <clears throat> but um, we can see that they, they are doing the same thing. They are treating these people like animals, and they are treating them like they're subhuman. And they're not really mad uh, at, at that idea. They're mad that they're being confronted by it and that they're being accused by it, uh, of it, rather. Um, so let's see. Let's see. Um, Here's one of the first jokes right here on this one. You're wondering, where are the jokes? I have been assured by a very knowing American of my acquaintance in London that a young, healthy child well-nourished is at a year old a most delicious, nourishing, and wholesome food. Um, so where does he get the idea for the cannibalism? He gets it from an American, right? If you know anything about America at this time, um, America was like very much a frontier sort of situation, lots of, uh, you know, Un undeveloped, really, in the traditional European sense, land, um, lots of kind of living in the elements uh, away from the civilization, quote unquote, that uh, Europe was used to. So the view of Americans was generally that they were riffraff, that they were woodsmen and that kind of thing. So for the author to have gotten the information from an American is actually a very subtle joke. Um, other stuff about this text, uh, another joke. Uh, here's one. Infant's flesh will be in season throughout the year, but more plentiful in March and a little before and after. For we are told by a grave author, an eminent French physician, that fish being a prolific diet, there are more children born in Roman Catholic countries about nine months after Lent. Um, so this is funny because if you know anything about Lent, um, I was raised Catholic, so I, I do know. Uh, Lent is a period of abstinence wherein you give something up. It's supposed to mirror the time that Jesus was in the desert for like 40 days and he had to renounce stuff and resist temptation. So during Lent, you're supposed to give things up. And typically people give up one thing. Some people give up a lot of things. Some people give up the hardest things to give up, if you understand what I'm saying. Uh, and so the joke is that, of course, after Lent, uh, there would be all of these babies, right? Do I have to spell that out? Hopefully not. So that's another joke, and that's, that's one way that you maybe could have um, realized that he was joking. Um, so, he, you know, as it goes on, he really, he really tries to make it stick. That, like, no, I'm, I'm suggesting that we should eat babies. And he really tries to gross you out. Here's one. Uh, Those who are more thrifty, as I must confess the times require, may flay the carcass, the skin of which, artificially dressed, will make admirable gloves for the ladies and summer boots for fine gentlemen. So he's advocating in this, in this bit for using the gloves, uh, using the skin to make gloves and boots for people to wear. 
Um, so he is very much grossing people out in this and very much really trying to shock people awake. And so my question to you is, I won't, I won't really hit this home too much since you've already read it and you will have watched the short video before. Um, does this work? If you cannot reach people, does it work to shock them? Does it work to jar them awake? I'll recall your attention to um, when we discussed Martin Luther King and his, his talking of tension and how tension was necessary. Uh, you know, I kind of think that a modest proposal is a perfect example of this necessary tension because that's what Swift was seeking to create. He realized that in the absence of this tension, the British people were comfortable to allow these atrocities to continue happening. And by creating this tension, he could jar these people awake. He could force them into uh, understanding and accepting the things that they were doing and accepting responsibility for those things. Um, and so does it work? You know, does this, is this something that you could keep on the back burner, something that you could remember in the future? Um, because, you know, as I mentioned when I talked about Dr. King, it's very important to try to make attempts to reach across the gap and attempts to get your reader to understand what you're saying. But if those attempts fail, what options do you have? Um, and satire is one of them. Um, so other than the dehumanizing language and the... Um, the use of, of figures uh, and the use of humor. These are the main signs that I could point to. Um, you know, the descriptive language is also itself a sign, uh, how he's kind of very visceral and very um, descriptive in, de in telling you how these recipes will be made and how he sort of seems like he's into it. Um, there are lots of things that you could analyze in this text. Um, and so remember, the goal of the third essay, as I said previously, is to analyze the text um, and not simply regurgitate it. A lot of times people will read these stories and read these things I assign, and then they'll say, oh, i got to write a paper on this, and they'll go and they'll sit down and they'll just summarize everything they already read. You don't need to do that because I've already read it, right? I've already read it. So if, if you summarize it for me, you're really just kind of like putting me to sleep in that sense, right? What you want to do is create an argument. What is the text doing? How is it doing it? Do you want to write about how Swift uses humor to get his point across? Do you want to write how Swift um, uses highly logistical figures in order to uh, convince his reader that he is serious? Um, you know, what do you want to look at? What sort of sign? Dehumanizing language? Uh, you know, think about signs, think about ways to interpret the text, and remember that your goal is to put forth an argument. The final thing that I would like to say about this, because I really don't want to just, you know, sit here and yammer on. I know you guys are probably ready to write, um, but I, I thought it was funny here at the end how, <clears throat> um, right at the end, he suggests uh, what they could do instead. Um, let me see, where is it? I can think of no objection that would be possibly raised against this proposal unless it should be urged that the number of people would thereby be much lessened in the kingdom. This I freely own, and twas indeed the principal design in offering it to the world. I desire that the reader will observe that I calculate my remedy for this one individual kingdom of Ireland. Uh, therefore, let no man talk to me of other expedients, of taxing our absentees at five shilling a pound, of using neither clothes nor household furniture except of what our own is our own growth and manufacture of utterly rejecting the materials and instruments to promote foreign luxury, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So he gives all of these different ways that they could actually be fixing the problem, but they're not. And one final thing I want you to think about um, as well, um, is there a way in which you are like the British? Is there a way in which your country and your collective involvement in that country is causing pain elsewhere in the world that you are unwilling to confront? And I won't give you the answer to that question because that's not really my job, but it is something that I want you to think about. Um, you know, think about where some of the products you consume are made. What kind of conditions are they made in? What sorts of um, military involvement is your country currently involved in? Do, do you know all of the places, all of the countries? Can you list them in which the United States uh, is currently or has been currently um, recently involved in? I think a lot of people can't, and they find that it's actually a lot more than they anticipated. Um, so there is maybe a way in which you're like the British, in which you're just waiting to be jarred awake by some uh, jerk who's wielding sat um, satire like it's some kind of weapon. Um, so just think about that. <clears throat> and 
Lastly, I'll read his final words. I profess in the sincerity of my heart that I have not the least personal interest in endeavoring to promote this necessary work, having no other motive than the public good of my country, by advancing our trade, providing for infants, relieving the poor, and giving some pleasure to the rich. I have no children by which I can propose to get a single penny, the youngest bearing, being nine years old and my wife past childbearing. So we end on a little bit of a joke there, like, oh, please don't accuse me of trying to profit by selling my own children, right? A uh, little bit of a, a humorous jab there at the end. So all in all, we have a piece that's a mixture of really heavy, uh, uncomfortable subjects with a little bit of uh, crude humor and ridicule for the ruling class of Britain. And I think it's really well done, and it's one of those pieces you might want to consider when you consider the value of literature. Uh, so I will post a few more pointers about this um, analyzing literature and coming up with theses and topic sentences in another shorter video after this one. Uh, but if you don't watch that or you're feeling comfortable already, uh, have an excellent week. Please email me with any questions. And uh, I hope you finish the semester strong. Take care.